Rupert here, Michael here. Welcome to the Prehistory Show. Once again, we're bringing you more archaeological news and information from around the world. Yes, this month we have news from Israel, America and Siberia. Yeah, that's true. What else? We'll be having a chat with our friend and all-round archaeological tour de force, Professor Tim Darville, OBE, to find out what he's up to at the moment. We'll be sharing a few minutes of a recent chat we had with Dr James Dilly, who makes some very interesting points about the types of axes we tend to call ceremonial. And, of course, we'll be rounding up with all our other regulars. Uh, who is the latest worthy recipient of the Prehistory Guys Stonehead of the Month Award, I wonder? I accept that we're not going to call it that anymore, are we? Oh, no, that's right. So, sorry. Well, um, <laughs> yes, we're changing it, folks. Why are we changing it, Rupert? Well, because uh, calling them stone's heads, it doesn't really translate in some places. So, <laughs> yeah. so we thought better, better to change the title a little bit. Yeah, Stonehead, Stonehead, Stonehead. It sort of dates back a little bit, anyway. It does yes. a little bit. So what is it? What are we, we're calling Prehistory Guys it's, Badge it's of badge Honour. Badge of Honour. Sounds proper grown up, that, doesn't it? It does proper grow up, yes. yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's still the Blue Peter Badge of Archaeology, let's face yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, no, Stoneheads yeah, didn't translate too well. Sad but true, <laughs> but probably a good thing all round. Anyway, <laughs> loads more to come, so let's get on with the show. So, news. What's first up in the news, Rupert? First up. Well, first up is a discovery from Tel Tsaf, a prehistoric village located <laughs> Tel Tsaf? in... Uh, Tel Tsaf? Oh, I don't know why that sounds north. like it's from no. up north. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be Wales. It's, it's, well, Tel Tsaf. Mm, 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 no, this is in northern Israel. Uh, oh, this not, is, not uh, Wales, yes, then. Tel Tsaf, it's, uh, it's a prehistoric <laughs> village located in the Beit Shan Valley, uh, I hope that's uh, the correct, uh, correct pronunciation, in northern Israel. Now, the site has been excavated a number of times since its discovery in the 1970s, but this latest report relates to the most recent excavations carried out between 2004 and 2007 by archaeologists from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It seems that they have uncovered a village dating back some 7,000 years, which appears to have been a thriving hub for traders spread over huge distances. Now, aside from houses, they've excavated a number of silos, the largest of which could hold up to 30 tonnes of grain. And one of the most significant sets of finds from this excavation is 150 clay seals, one of which has two distinct geometric designs inscribed into the clay. Now, clay seals have been found before, some even earlier than these, but this is the earliest known example of an owner's mark. The seals were used in the same way as the much later sealing wax to keep something private or prevent goods or grain from being tampered with. And clearly, if the seal was broken, then some of your shipment may have been taken. It's been suggested that the two geometric patterns on the single seal could suggest two individuals involved in the trading. And to add to all that, analysis revealed that the clay came from at least 10 kilometres away, but could actually have come from much further afield, as a number of other metal and pottery items found at the site came from such far-flung places as Mesopotamia, Egypt, and even further north in Caucasia. Wow. So, 7,000 years old, as far as we know, that's before money was invented. So what kind of international bartering system must have been in place in a bustling centre of trade? I mean, it's, it's fascinating how many discoveries are being made that seem to show a much deeper complexity in prehistoric trading. And it's you, you it's know, but true, the, isn't it? But the thing is, you know, the, the perspective that we need to keep in mind is what, this is 4000 BCE, and over here in, you know, what is now Britain, We'd be shocked to find any evidence of such activity. You know, this you you said a, what did you a, a hub of trading activity yeah. was that the phrase you used? Yes. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, 
yeah, it just goes to show, you know, the, the divide, the divide. It and, really and, does. You know, what was going it on really in does. Yeah. different parts Amazing. of the world. Amazing. But there we go. I mean, mm. it is. it has to be said, you know, it is so exciting looking through the mm. research that's being published around the world every week. Yeah, I indeed. Think, yeah. yeah. And to add uh, to the global mood, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is from one of our favourite sources for discoveries in recent years. It's the trusty Siberian Times. And we love the Siberian Times. We, we do. It's a great source. And this is not the first time we've mentioned discoveries relating to the Odinov culture. Now, this comes from the Novosibirsk region of western Siberia, dating to about 5,000 years ago. It's the discovery of a burial containing a man laid on his back and a woman laid on top of him facing downwards, so they were facing each other. They were both enclosed in a birch bar covering which had been burnt before burial, but the remarkable find in this grave is a small clay statuette placed beside the woman's shoulder, which has a mask carved from a horse vertebra, apparently depicting the face of a bear. Now, this is all quite unique. It's never been seen before, and the details are really intricate. The statuette is the size of a small doll with a line on one cheek, which the archaeologists believe represents a tattoo. It also has a deep groove down the body, which was filled with some organic substance, it is being tested, so we don't yet know what the substance was. But stranger and stranger, the doll was buried face down, but its head was broken off and turned around to face upwards. So what's all that about? I have to say, though, uh, although the researchers have made that observation, I think it's equally possible the doll was already broken before the burial. So when it was placed in the grave, the doll's body was put down in position. And if it had any fabric around it that uh, has long since rotted away, may not have been all that obvious which was the front. So when the tiny head was put beside it, it, um, it would have been natural to have it facing upwards. I don't know. Anyway, as I said... Taste tests ongoing, uh, so uh, we'll bring you more news when it's available. Mm, fantastic. Well, this item is a bit of a surprise coming from America. A team headed by Professor Michael Waters, director of the Centre I mean, for the it's Study It's a surprise, of or it's a surprise that it's coming from America? <laughs> no, don't be like that. It's a surprise <laughs> coming from America. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I thought so, what you meant. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, um, it's uh, Michael Waters, director of the Centre for the Study of the First Americans, along with Texas A&M University anthropologist David Carlson and Thomas Stafford of Stafford Research in Colorado, did a study to try to pin down some more accurate dates to known Clovis sites. So they ran C14 tests on bones, plant remains and charcoal found at 10 sites from across the states and every date came back within a 300-year window of times between 1350 to 12,750 years ago. Now, 10 sites doesn't sound like a big enough sample on which to base such an overarching conclusion that Clovis culture existed for such a short period of time. But we can't ignore the fact that the sites are all over the place, from Montana in the northwest to Pennsylvania over in the east and all the way down to Oklahoma in the south. So the question is why? What happened to make such a widespread culture just disappear? Professor Walters did point out that these dates show that Clovis people arrived on the scene 300 years before the last megafauna died out. Or to put it another way, it took 300 years for the megafauna, such as mammoths and giant sloths, to die out after the arrival of Clovis. Oh, right. So okay. it is possible that <laughs> yeah. once those animals died out, it made more sense to develop a different uh. style of weapon for catching smaller prey, as is so often the case. Answering one question just raises a hundred more. Yeah, God, wouldn't it be so easy to uh, turn this into a four-hour show following, <laughs> chasing down all the avenues, all the rabbit holes? We could go with that one, you know, we, you know, about whether animals died out or whether humans made them extinct, uh, yeah. how efficient the Clovis blades were, too efficient, not efficient enough, oh, yeah, wh what have yeah. you. Uh, and yeah. that's what... <gasps> so many aspects are leaning on this. <laughs> Gee... Anyway, uh, 
Isn't that the truth that we could talk for hours? Uh, however, however, you'll be pleased to know, or maybe not, I don't know. That is the news for today. We're drawing a line. <laughs> So, moving on. Oh, I love this bit. It's time for Prehistory People, when we take a look behind the scenes to find out what archaeologists and prehistorians are working on out of the public eye. And this month, we're going to have a chat with our good friend and all-round tour de force, Professor Tim Darville, OBE. Mm -hmm. rare, rare beasts, archaeologists with OBEs. It's anyway, true. Tim is always busy, so we gave him a call to see what's happening. And here's a little chat we had with him earlier on. Roll VT. <laughs> Hi, Tim. It's great to see you again. How are you doing? Great to see you. Yeah, we're doing well. Looking forward to a bit of summer sunshine. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Well, Tim, you know, you, you know the spot. You know the spot. We're just we're calling you to find out what you're up to. Um, hiding away in the backgrounds, as usual. What you hiding away in the background? Well, you know... Um, for me, in the university at this time of year, it's all about marking exams and, and sorting out exam boards and things, which is uh, what goes on just at the moment, and, and looking forward to getting out into the field come yeah. end of July and, and August, and we really hope things are going to loosen up. But, you know, archaeology at the moment is going absolutely full tilt, and um, as you well know, I'm quite involved in Cotswold Archaeology and a number of other organisations, and um, really there's more archaeology going on now than there ever has been in the last 30 or 40 years that these organisations oh, wow. have been in, in existence. Um, HS2 is, of course, one of the big news areas, and we see this popping yeah. up in the paper um, on a regular basis. I believe there's something like 400 archaeologists working on that project at this moment. Wow. And oh, if one could find a few more, there was probably spaces for a few more over the next few weeks as well. We've got to the situation where actually we've kind of run out of, of archaeological labour. There's, there's opportunities. If anyone's out there who wants to do some, some archaeological work and has got some experience, um, mm -hmm. finding experienced people now, we've, we've pretty much come to the end of, of those who want to do it. So there's Goodness. great opportunities if you want to get back into, who would into have that. Thought, who would have thought uh, being an archaeologist would be a good employment It's a project, very, yeah. very in-demand <laughs> post at the moment, um, especially if you've, if you've got some experience. This is, what, yeah. this is what we need. So there's an awful lot of things going on, but there's lots of other projects going on too. We, we you know we've talked in the past about um, the Stonehenge Tunnel. You know that's that's going to kick off in the next few months if it all goes yeah. well with the various reviews that are going on at the moment. There's all sorts of infrastructure being developed all over the country, and, and archaeological contractors are quite stretched at the moment. It's going to, of course, yeah. has a really profound implication. Um, that's going to lead to some incredible discoveries and some incredible stories to be told as the the harvest, if you like, of that work starts to yeah. be brought in mm, and analysed yeah. and put together. And there's going to be some some extraordinary stuff because many of these schemes go into landscapes we've just never looked at before. You know. Big slices of HS2 go through areas of the landscape where we haven't really got much information in the past. Mm. Um, it's the same with the Stonehenge Tunnel, the A303. It's not just the tunnel at Stonehenge, it's all the stuff to the west that's going to yield interesting results there. The nice thing about developer archaeology is it takes you to places that you might not otherwise choose to go. Mm. Yeah, sure. And there's always a you know, fascination amongst archaeologists, and I guess I'm as guilty as everybody, that you tend to go back to places you know. And sometimes you do need a little bit of a kick up behind just to <laughs> then you, send you off to landscapes and areas that you perhaps hadn't thought of. And mm -hmm. without exception, without exception over the years, these unknown places turn out to be rich. Rich mm. in things that we just didn't really anticipate. And mm. just fantastic. And we've also, you know, this sounds a bit odd, I know, but we've also got to take account of the gaps because there's a, there's a temptation to think that the past was continuous, that the past involved everybody everywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, no, no, especially when we get back into prehistory, the numbers of people are not great. We don't know precisely what the populations were, but they, they certainly weren't huge. And there was whole tracts of the landscape which people didn't use for centuries or mm. Mm. You know, maybe longer sometimes. Um, and so finding out where there's not stuff is actually just as important as finding out where there is stuff. So finding out where people didn't build long barrows or didn't build round barrows yeah. or didn't have any henges is just as just important to be certain of that as it is to be certain of the places where they did do these sure, things. Sure, sure. Yeah. So what's beginning to appear, in a sense, is a, is a bit more of a patchwork of the past so that yes they are doing things which are familiar to us in some places but in other areas they're doing something quite different 
Mm. And we do need a bit of a kick sometimes to go down and, and have a look in these other places. And yeah. Development is something we, we don't decide where development happens. Other people decide that. But it does give us the beautiful opportunity to get into those places and, and have a look. And sometimes you don't find a lot. That's important. Sometimes you find stuff you weren't expecting. That's important. Sometimes you find stuff that you kind of knew about, but now we've got better information and a better story from it. Yeah. So that's important yeah. too. Exciting times. in the work. That's the thing. Yes. Yeah. It's exciting times. It's so so uh, how are things going with uh, with Human Henge? Is that is that uh, uh, trudging along? How's that going? Human Henge is, is one of those projects that's um, had to be put on hold a little bit during the, the COVID um, mm, emergency. Mm. Um, we did some pilot studies. Human Henge is, is, in a sense, a pilot study a few years ago now at Stonehenge and Avebury. And it was it was a project which introduced what we've come to call a sort of cultural therapy, cultural heritage therapy, which allows us to use ancient monuments to promote mental health well-being. And uh, we published a fantastic book on it. Perhaps, uh, perhaps you've seen it before. Here it is, uh, published by Archeo Press, And um, it's free. You can download it from Archeo Press to have a look at. There's lots of stuff about Human Henge in there, but also about other projects which are um, really trying to deal with similar sorts of issues mm. and lead us into what I think is one of the big questions for, for archaeology at the moment, and that is how we make the past work for us. Mm. Uh-huh. How do we make these ancient monuments useful to us in the modern age. Well, they tell us a lot of interesting stuff about the past. Um, they're great places for tourism, of course. Uh, they're used in all sorts of sorts of ways, but we need new uses. We can't just carry on with just using them in a very traditional sorts of way. How can we use them into the present? How can we make the money that we spend, the effort that we go to to conserve these monuments, to look after them, how can we use that to create new values, to create new ideas, to create new ways of doing things? And it seems to me that one of the biggest questions, one of the biggest problems facing our world at the moment is, is that of well-being in general and, and mental health well-being in particular. So how can we use our sites to really help people? That's fantastic. With these, Putting with new these life conditions. into old stones. Putting new life into old sites, into old stones, yeah. that's, um, that's important. So, so what, what's, the, you know, what's the website people should go to? to uh, 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 well, the to book is avail- it's published by Archeo Press, yep. and uh, it's on their website. And um, you can download a PDF copy, or if you want a hard copy, you can buy a copy, but you can download it for free. Brilliant. Mm. Brilliant well, book. Tim, thank you so much. It's always good to see you. Mm. Mm. And Great to see you guys, too. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah. See you again soon. Take good care. See you again soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm. I could chat with Tim for hours. Yeah, I know. He's an extraordinary breadth of knowledge, mm. well of information. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, anyway, moving on. Uh, you've been out and about again, haven't you? Uh, where are you taking us this time? Yeah, well, once again, uh, you haven't had to go very far. Uh, I've ventured out into the countryside, uh, quite n- near to me. Um, yeah, let's see where I went. Roll VT. However, before we get there... I'm taking you into a little town called Chipping Norton. Uh, Why am I taking you to Chipping Norton? What I've come to show you is right behind me here in Chipping Norton. This is the Chipping Norton Theatre. Now, the reason I'm here is that this place is the first place that our film Standing With Stones met its audience for the first time. It had its premiere here back in uh, 2008 and we raised a thousand pounds. Uh, for the Roll Rights Trust, Roll Rights Stones, of course, only being uh, a couple of miles down the road from here. Anyway, that's why I brought you here. It's a lovely little place. If you're ever um, in Chipping Norton, uh, give it a visit. You see, here's the thing. A very large part of this exercise is going to be an experiment in finding long barrows, an experiment in using new kit for the first time. It's a good job I know what I'm doing, isn't it? I think uh, I think what we're looking for is off over there, not far from the main road, actually. Oh, I've just seen something I'm looking for. Would you believe it? A quite a large standing stone. that uh, 
It was once the main blocking stone for the Long Barrow itself. still very close to the main road so it's not the most secluded and uh, silent spot. Oh and um, another stone which probably marks the uh, at least the, near the end of the long barrow. We can definitely see that uh, that's the uh, end of the long barrow there. However I wonder if there's a way in through this undergrowth too. Have a proper look at what's in there. Aha! Is this a way in? How do you work this? Oh gee. Right. Oh! Well I'm not getting very far but there's a load of cairn material in here. Behold! The side of the barrow. Goodness gracious me. Oh dear. However, uh, I'm not so sure that uh, that's going to be the ideal way in. Well, I've come back to what I think is the northeast end of, uh, of the barrow. Um, what I can see there is what looks like, uh, well, the only way into the undergrowth. <laughs> oh yeah, you know how to have a good time. I think that looks like it's about as good as it gets. Just uh, nettles, nettles and more nettles and beyond that I don't really see a way of getting any benefit out of this. I wonder if it's any better this way. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Uh, I can feel more stones underfoot there, uh, under the moss. But uh, it seems that that is about it. Welcome to Lynham Long Barrow. If it wasn't for that standing stone, this monument would be more or less invisible. There are around 200 Cotswold 7 Long Barrows that are known of. However, we're used to celebrating and visiting the ones that we can see. Wayland Smithy, Stony Littleton, Bayless Knapp, to name but a few. The fact is, we can see those because somebody took the trouble to ensure they were protected and restored. Lynham Long Barrow is just one of a great many that escaped that kind of attention. Wonderful stuff, Mr. B. It really is amazing quite how much of the ancient world is still all around us if we peek a little deeper into the shadows. I thank you. And yes, it really does show how so many lumps and bumps in the landscape might be way more significant than first appears. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, well, the point I'm trying to make, though, is that so much of the stuff that we do appreciate in the landscape now, we owe to people who took the time to look after them. Um, that, uh, you know, if I can just take the moment to reiterate that fact, that that little film is just kind of hats off uh, to all those folk, you know, beginning in, probably in the 18th century. And, you know, so much work was done in the 19th century, late 19th century, uh, you know, preserving this stuff. And, and unless they'd done that work, places like Bellis Knapp, Wayland Smithy and, uh, and uh, you know, the rest, yeah, uh, little Hetty yeah, Pegler's so Tump, yeah. these kinds of things would have just disappeared. Uh, into the green. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. I mean, I, I had no idea, actually. I had no idea that uh, the Lynham Longborough was even there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, shall we uh, shall we move on uh, to the, yes. the, the next thing? What is next? Um, what is next? next oh, win? right. No, it's me. And as you all know, we regularly interview archaeologists about their work. And from time to time, we've been genuinely surprised when someone has given us a completely new way at looking at something. Recently, we interviewed experimental archaeologist Dr. James Dilley, and he gave us a completely different perspective on the kinds of stone axes that are generally thought to be ceremonial. 
So we thought we'd share a few minutes of that conversation with you. I begin by, uh, yeah, asking him the pertinent question about green stone axes. I mean, actually, talking about uh, stone axes and, and the, the quarrying of, we know that uh, stone, axes had, uh, stone axes had a special place for Neolithic people, and, uh, and green stone axes have been found you know, vast distances away from where the walk, rock was originally quarried. And th these have always been kind of regarded as somehow uh, symbolic and, you know, not so much the, the, the practical. D do you have any thoughts on that about, you know, the division between the symbolic and the practical, the, you know, the emblematic and, and uh, whether people actually used them or not? I knew that was going to be a slightly controversial question, um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> we like it's a question that I like because I, I yeah. suppose I try to approach it and uh, it purely based on opinion and uh, interpretation over the years. You know, the the likes of the, the greats of uh, Alison Sheridan, who have their own opinions, yeah. and uh, various other well-known prehistorians have their opinion on. Uh, particularly greenstone axes and uh, various others. But I've worked with a, a very few types of uh, lithic material uh, from the British Isles that I haven't worked with now. Um, I've worked, even worked with Jadeite, of course, the likes of Langdale Tough, um, yeah. Group 6, and uh, the Frag Fluid uh, Group 7, um, to name a few. Um, and having made lots of the axes and tested them for tree felling and woodworking, the best axes by far are the volcanic axes, whether that be Frag Fluid or the um, Langdale Tough. They flake, and, and those two in particular, uh, I'll stick with them for now, the Frag Fluid and Langdale axes, they're really easy to yeah. flake, they're as easy to flake as flint. Um, and they polish in half the time because they're not as hard as flint. And I suppose the thing to bear in mind is that an axe head is a high energy tool um, is going to be hitting a hard surface continually. A lot of shocks going to be going through it. And that kind of shock is very similar to flint napping. You always strike the edges with flint napping, or almost always, to yeah. undercut material that comes off the bottom as a flake. And through that, it, the process is quite similar. So if you've got your axe head continually smashing into the, uh, the face of a tree trunk right at the very thin blade, similar levels of shock or types of shock are traveling through the axe head. Flint is very, very hard. And for anyone who's reasonably familiar with flint, if you tap it, sometimes it really rings like a sheet of uh, steel or glass, very similar to glass in uh, its um, chemical composition. Glass is very fragile. It's very hard. If you try and squeeze it, you can't. But if you try and break it, it's a lot easier because hardness comes with brittleness. Mm. The Volcanic axes are not quite as hard. They have uh, some elasticity to them, and that's simply because they generally don't have as much silica in and uh, other minerals as well. And that gives it that slight uh, composite strength uh, that means that it can withstand compression stress and twist strain if it was in an axe handle that flint generally can't. And uh, as I said, the beauty of uh, volcanic axes is you can polish them in half the time. A, f a flint axe, 20 centimetres or so, 60 hours work, roughly. A, l a big investment of time. It makes a huge difference to the functionality, and I'll get on to that. But for the volcanic axes, 30 hours or less. Massive difference. Wow. And they can look aesthetically very, very pleasing it's only yeah. for Langdale axes, and you can understand why theories have come about about their purely aesthetic qualities over functionality. But to get yeah. on to the reason behind polishing, a study in uh, Scandinavia found quite clearly that by polishing the surface of any flaked stone, you take away all those ridges and troughs that you get from flake scars, and you see those flake scars on hand axes, axes, all kinds of flake stone, not necessarily flint. Each time the edge is struck, whether it be flint napping or to be struck against a tree, the shock that you put through it will travel and focus along the surface, but if it can, along those ridges, the edges of flake scars. That means you're going to get localised stress. And as you have that repetitive strain, as it strikes the tree, that stress is going to build up it can't easily travel through the axe 
quick enough often. And with something very brittle, localised stress will lead to microfractures. And as that builds, the axe head can fail and break. If the surface is totally smooth, the shock, which will try and travel at the surface, has to travel evenly. There are no areas it can localise. So you're reducing the overall stress going through the axe head and reducing the chance of microfractures and failure simply by removing the topographic features. It's amazing to realise that people understood not just, oh, you can hit rocks and you can understand how the flakes come off, but looking at how to improve the longevity of mm. the object. And you don't just see that in the Neolithics far earlier too. So so would that uh, extend to the even more exotic um, stones, like those from the Italian Alps? I think the the jadeotite axes are a bit of a specialism. Um, they're extremely okay. early. Um, yeah. And I think, certainly looking at uh, various research that's out there, even by the time they, they get to Britain, they're, they're thought to be very old by the time they get here mm. already. And like the exchange of shells in islands in, around the Pacific, there's value that builds as they're traded and they, they gain their own heritage. Mm. However, um, some of the axes are very thin. Some of them are not. They're more torpedo-shaped. And people mm -hmm. have suggested that jadeotite is, is just not strong enough to withstand being turned into an axe head and used. But go and look at footage of uh, people in Papua New Guinea felling trees with jadeotite and nephrite axes. It's an extremely hard material. So mm. it's possible that some of them were used, but for the high level of polish on some of them that you see in Devizes Museum have got sort of a mirror-like finish and it's almost imperial jade quality. I'm not sure I'd use it. There you go. It's always very eye-opening, isn't it? Talking with experimental archaeologists who've learnt from real-world trial and error. Eh? Yeah, that, that is the thing, isn't it? Always pausing for a reality check. It, it, yeah. You know, it reminds me of Bruce's uh, comment. Uh, as Bruce Bradley oh, yes. said to us, it's amazing how many experts write papers on hunting when they've never so much as shot a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that just about nails the point. Shall we just draw a line on that before we get ourselves <laughs> into trouble? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, don't forget, folks, you can see the full interview with James on the Prehistory Guys channel. And if you really enjoyed it, there's even an extended version over on our uh, Patreon page. Hint, hint. <laughs> And now, drum roll please, if we're lucky, it's time to name the latest recipient of the Prehistory Guys Badge of Honour. <laughs> yes, and this month, after watching Michael peering into the gloom at Lynham Longbarrow. Oh, it's for me, is it? <laughs> no, it is not. The coveted blue piece oh, of archaeology give the badge to me. <laughs> goes to Scottish archaeologist Hamish Fenton for taking Damn. peeking into the shadows to a whole new level. Hmm. Now, many of you may have seen the recent reports of a rare form of rock art discovered up in Western Scotland in Kilmartin Glen. Well, Hamish is the man who found them, and seriously, hats off to him for scrambling into the gloom and finding them at the early Bronze Age cairn of Duncraig Egg. Yeah, that rare form of rock art is actually a group of five carvings depicting deer, some recognisable as red deer with rather splendid antlers. The others may also be red deer, but it's not easy to tell with four or five thousand years of weathering. They're certainly the earliest known depictions of animals ever found in Scotland, and even a bigger hat's off to Hamish because the carvings are pecked onto the capstone of one of the kists and are really not that easy to see anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a bit of a surprise to find out that Hamish actually found the carving some years ago, but it always takes time to have these things officially logged and recorded, so... Hopefully, on the next show, we'll be getting Hamish to join us for a chat about it. In the meantime, congratulations to the man for making a fantastic discovery and reminding us that we should always look twice at rock faces. Yes, we should. Yeah, it's amazing to think that uh, back in 2007, we walked past that kiss, that can. <laughs> Uh, you know, mm, mind did. you, I yeah. don't think, I, I can't imagine what would have drawn us into that dark space. Because that's the thing to remember. These carvings were on the, on the underside of mm. that kist. 
in the dark. So you, you you've got to be pretty intentional and uh, getting in there with a with a with a torch to to find. Yeah. So as we say, hats off. Actually, yeah. Hamish. He, he's another one, you know. We we could crown um, Mister Ubiquity, isn't it? Because he gets about well, a bit. That's true. That is true. He does yeah. get about a bit, actually. <laughs> In fact, uh, I got a, quite a lot of my information. <laughs> what information there was, uh, you know, for seeking out um, the line of long barrow from Hamish's entry uh, entries on the um, megalithic portal. So. Um, well, yes, I mean, it begs a, that's, the question. That's quite a, a range he spreads. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, hats off once, twice, thrice. But shall we send him three badges? That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, well done, Hamish. Uh, Hamish, three Still badge fencing. Work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All of which uh, brings us romping into the home straight with a little bit of whimsy, as if we haven't been whimsical yeah, enough yes, already. Yes, you dug up a cracker here, didn't you? Well, I think so. Um, this is uh, another wonderful example of not taking things at face value. Up in Runcorn, in the north of England, lies a little-known modest stone circle comprised of nine small stones situated on a small mound. Now, a researcher by the name of Mark Olly, uh, do you think he should get a badge as well, perhaps? <laughs> Uh, was was looking into the circle for his book called Celtic Warrington and Other Mysteries, vol <laughs> Volume Three, no less. I think he's another three badge um, <laughs> recipient. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> mm. oh, Celtic Warrington and Other Mysteries, Volume Three. Is there a Volume Four? Uh, <laughs> will there be a Volume Four? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm anyway. He. He was looking into the uh, into the circle because he wanted to find out about the circle's history. Was the mound a Bronze Age barrow or maybe a, a modern folly? After all, there are five completely modern stone circles in neighbouring Warrington. <laughs> Would you believe <laughs> five modern stone circles in Warrington? You really have to wonder why. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, apparently so. I mean, who, who knew? Anyway, to add to the confusion, Mark Olly came with with a, a trail of conflicting information. There are mounds in the region called Coney Greaves or Coney Graves on some maps that could refer to rabbit warrens, which are medieval mounds specifically raised to farm rabbits. The Cheshire Archaeology Planning Advisory Service did confirm that there were indeed rabbit warrens in the area, but there was no record of anything prehistoric, and certainly none of the older maps showed anything on the site. A lot of further research eventually revealed the slightly less exci exciting answer. It seems the Runcorn Circle was constructed by a development company when the new road system was being built. But no data is available for when it was constructed, and certainly no information regarding why it was done in the first place. So, basically, we should never judge a barrow by its mound, or a circle by its anything, really. <laughs> uh, it actually seems modern circles are plentiful in the north. <laughs> that is priceless. That is priceless, yeah. Five in uh, Warrington, just... I, I, I know, and nobody knows what they were for. No. Maybe. <laughs> well, what's that for? We've what's commented that, what, on what's it before, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 We've commented before, haven't we, you know, that you've got Bronze Age circles and Neolithic circles, and, and we've said before, you know, that maybe the Bronze Age circles were just follies in... Homage to the the Neolithic circles that they didn't know what they were for either. Maybe we're just carrying on the whole. Yeah, um, uh, maybe maybe hmm. nobody ever knew what they were for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey ho. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, that's it for this month, folks. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to help the Prehistory Guys channel to grow. 
Yes, and don't forget, if you want to help us produce more films and programs and get all of our content without any advertising, come and join us on our Patreon page, where you get additional perks with your membership, and not to mention all the other regular content that's only available to our patrons. So that's it, folks. Yeah, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye, folks. Bye, folks.